And there are uh, other kinds of fibers uh, that, that we don't digest well. And in fact, there's even protein fibers that we don't digest well. Uh, so if you were to eat leather, for example, you would not get much out of it. If you were to eat hair, you would not get much out of it. Those are proteins. Hair is a keratin protein that, that you can't eat. I don't have much, but I do have some. You have like <laughs> thousands more than I do. <laughs> Let's get this party started, shall we? How's everybody doing today? I got my Vikings gear on today. I'm drinking from my Green Bay Tears mug, coffee mug this morning or this afternoon. Um, this is the week we celebrate Aaron Rodgers going to the New York Jets. So uh, welcome. This is not a football podcast or webinar. This is the Fixed Blood Sugar webinar. See, so let's let's start things off. As we wait for Dr. Saunders to hop on here with us, let's talk about how football can affect our blood sugar today, shall we? Uh, I'm just kind of being goofy this morning. So uh, why do I keep saying morning? I've been up for like six hours. Well, it's good to have you guys here. This is episode 100 and her of her about the blood sugar, uh, fixed blood sugar webinar. I don't know what that is. It's somewhere around 189, 190. That means every week for the past 180 some weeks, we've been coming on live and answering your questions from the Diabetes Solution Kit from Barton Publishing. This is our flagship product, our most popular, best selling product we've sold almost a million copies of these in either the printed or digital form. And so we're gonna be talking about all things diabetes type two. Dr. Saunders is our medical advisor. He is going to hop on here shortly, hopefully. Um, sometimes he's seen patients that run a little bit longer and um, Leslie is also running a little behind. So I'm navigating things right now as we get started. So I didn't want you guys to uh, uh, wonder where we were or whatever. So um, again, cheers to the Green Bay Packers fans out there. Uh, you know, as a Vikings fan, um, I'm almost 50 and the Vikings haven't been in the Super Bowl since I was three years old. So that's wonderful. The draft is tomorrow. I haven't been following it. I'm not expecting great things for my team, but you know, what would life be without having a little bit of suffering and hardship uh, in, you know, in sports teams you follow or other things like it's good for you. Pain and suffering. You know, we could have a whole webinar on pain and suffering and how that's good for you. In the Bible, James says, um, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you go through all sorts of various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, and that's a good thing. We all need patience. We all need resilience, and so maybe you're here today for the first time. Let's uh, let's see if anyone's in the chat. Let's go ahead and hit that chat button down below, and then you can click like everyone. Hey, there's Butch. Hello, hello, and uh, say hi. Like, share some good news. I like to start off when we have our internal team meetings. We share good news together. So, put something in the chat with everyone. What's some good news that um, you've ha had going on this year or this this uh, this week? And share the good news. And my good news is Dr. Saunders is here to help us. We I've been stalling like you wouldn't believe, Dr. Scott. Stalling. <laughs> Stalling. Okay. Uh, I'm talking football. I'm talking, I quoted a little from the book of James about um, pain and suffering related to football and how going through trials is good and all that. So um, I'm glad you're here, Dr. Saunders. Um, I don't know if Me we're doing... <laughs> I don't know. Are we doing a the basics this week or was that last week? Um, this week, uh, we're supposed to do like either a high fiber diet. Um, that's that's what we were talking about. Okay. Well, Rayanne says I don't do football. I'm glad to see Dr. Saunders. In other words, she was about <laughs> ready. To, she was about ready to get out of here. So yes, we're all yeah. glad that you're here. 
So go ahead and kick us off, Dr. Scott. Okay. Okay. So first of all, um, keep in mind that everything we talk about here is for general use and for informational purposes and is not like a specific advice to you uh, for, because your situation might not apply. And so it's really important that you find out if what we're talking about applies to you specifically because it's not going to be for everyone. Everybody's different and, and we can't, we have to take the, the big picture into account and not specifics. If you have specific questions, then you can ask them and, and I'll give answers to that specific case, for example. Um, but it's still not advice for you necessarily because there might be other factors in your case. So um, having said that, let's talk about fiber and, uh, and, and what fiber is and what it does and, and all that stuff. Fiber is whatever we don't digest. Uh, so we eat things and whatever we don't digest. So if you were to eat cardboard, um, and cardboard is a carbohydrate. It's a sugar. In fact, it's a bunch of sugars. And you know what kind of sugar it is? It's glucose. And really? guess what? You can use glucose. And glucose is really great uh, for energy. It gives you, you know, quick energy and it's really good. There's a problem with the cellulose fibers in, in cardboard though, and in wood. And that is that those glucose molecules, instead of being connected uh, in, in the way that you can digest them and, and cut them apart, the, the, the glucose molecules are opposite and they have a, a different configuration. They're connected differently and you don't have an enzyme to break those down. Now, <clears throat> there are certain bacteria that do have an enzyme to break those down. So um, animals like horses and cows can live on grass and you can't digest grass because you don't have the enzymes to digest grass. And guess what? Neither do the horses or cows. But what they do is they have um, a bunch of different stomachs um, with different types of digestion in them. And they also have bacteria, which produce enzymes between the stomachs and the bacteria, produce enzymes that can break down those cellulose fibers uh, and, and, may, and get the glucose out of it and use that for sugar, just like you can use spaghetti. Uh, so a horse can use cardboard the way you use spaghetti. <laughs> Uh, and that's, uh, that's because they can break it down and you can't, but also because you can't break it down, then it goes right through your system. It goes all the way through. It goes into the colon and guess what? There are bacteria in your colon that make enzymes that can break that down and use it. And the bacteria go, oh boy, we have cellulose fibers. We can use that, uh, for energy. And so you start growing that kind of bacteria. And there are other kinds of things like uh, fructooligosaccharides, and those are also sugars. And there are fructose sugars instead of glucose sugars that are connected in a, in a way that you can't break them apart and digest them and, and use that sugar. So they go down into the large intestine and the, and the bacteria in the large intestine go, oh boy, fructose oligosaccharides, that's just what I need. And they break it down and take the fructose out and take the glucose out and they start using that for energy. Um, and there are uh, other kinds of fibers uh, that, that we don't digest well. And in fact, there's even protein fibers that we don't digest well. Uh, so if you were to eat leather, for example, you would not get much out of it. If you were to eat hair, you would not get much out of it. Those are proteins. Hair is a keratin protein that, that you can't eat. I don't have much, but I do have some. You have like <laughs> thousands more than I do. <laughs> uh, so um, uh, the, the hair, the keratin is not broken down. You don't have enzymes to digest keratin, um, but there are bacteria that do and they can break down keratin. There's a uh, fungus uh, that does too. Um, and, uh, and uh, collagen, <clears throat> collagen is what is what it, like um, leather is made of collagen and your skin is made of collagen, actually keratin on the top and collagen underneath. Um, and uh, so, and you can't break that down. So there's, there's that type of fiber. That's also fiber that goes down into the 
uh, large intestine and bacteria break it down and they go, oh boy, we have protein. This is just what we needed. And, uh, and they break it down and use it. So that's what fiber is. It's what you don't digest that the bacteria in your colon can digest. And uh, well, why is it so important? Well, because that's how you feed the bacteria in your colon. And that's important. Um, bacteria uh, like has become, uh, as more research is done, has become so important that we begin to uh, feel like as the, the researchers look at it and they say, well, a human being is really just the ship that is, uh, that is controlled by the bacteria. That is really the bacteria in your colon is our purpose for existence. Uh, we only exist to feed our, our colon and our bacteria, to transport the colon and our bacteria all over the place, um, and, and to provide an environment where they can live. So we're like, uh, like a spaceship out in space and all these bacteria live inside us and we feed them and, and we give them the right temperature and we give them all they need and we take away their waste products. Um, and, uh, and that's, that's what we provide for them. So what do they provide for us? Um, they provide a lot of things, vitamins that we can't make. You can't make vitamin B12. You have to either eat it or it's made by your bacteria um, in your colon. It's made by bacteria in the colons of cows and horses. And so people often wonder, wait a minute, if you're vegan, there's no plant that makes vitamin B12. So how are you ever gonna get vitamin B12 if, if, if you're vegan, right? Um, well, it used to be that when um, farms were fertilized by, by cows, uh, by manure, um, guess, what, guess what's in that manure? Vitamin B12, why? Because there's bacteria in the colons uh, in the intestines of the cows and the horses and whatever animals uh, that are making the vitamin B12. So as you fertilize with manure, you're putting vitamin B12 on the plants uh, and the plants take it up and then you eat the plants and you're getting vitamin B12. The plant didn't make it. Well, what happens when you fertilize with chemical fertilizers? Well, there's no vitamin B12 in that. So you're not gonna get any uh, from your plants uh, if, if that's the case. Um, so now vegans have to supplement with vitamin B12 because they, uh, they're, they don't, because there's, they can't get it from their food. So um, just a, a little side note there. <laughs> so the, the fiber is what allows those bacteria to grow that make the vitamins for us. And they make um, uh, anti-inflammatory uh, uh, chemicals that suppress inflammation. And they, they help you feel better. Um, these, uh, the, the chemicals that they make go into your brain and you say, mm, life is good. I feel good because I have the right bacteria in my intestines. If, if they take the bacteria from someone who's depressed and give it and put it into the colon of somebody who's not depressed, you can make them depressed. Uh, mm. And it works the other way around, too. If you switch the bacteria, the, the, wow. the, the colon bacteria is that powerful and that important. You wow. need to feed them properly. Wow. And the way you feed them is with, with, with fiber. So you have to give them the right fiber. So what's the best way to do this? Um, it's not to take psyllium seed every day and put it in a glass and, and drink it down. It's not to take the Barton fiber greens and put it into a glass and drink it down. Um, and the best way to get your fiber is from food. So if you look at food as how much fiber am I getting in that food, instead of looking at how much protein or carbs, well, in your case, because you have diabetes. Uh, so everybody here, let's assume you have diabetes. Okay, you're going to count the carbs. But remember, protein doesn't, or, or fiber doesn't count. You don't even have to worry about that. So you can eat as much fiber as you want. Like for example, broccoli. Broccoli has a lot of fiber and almost no carbs. Celery, a ton of fiber and almost no carbs. Um, 
and uh, and spinach and lettuce. And, uh, so all of those that have uh, high fiber and low carb um, avocados, stuff like that, um, those are things you can eat as much as you want. And, and in that case, uh, you're going to get enough fiber because each plant has different types of fiber and will grow different types of bacteria. So you have to remember that when you're eating, you're eating for your bacteria. Um, there's, there's uh, I think like uh, 300 trillion bacteria in a colon. Um, and think of this, that your body has between 80 and 100 trillion cells. So there is more bacteria in your colon than there is cells in your whole body. Um, you have more um, colon, you have more DNA from bacteria than you have uh, in your whole body of your own DNA. Mm. That's, why, that's why the researchers look at it as, as the body that, that we think we own is really owned by the bacteria and we're just the, the ship or the, um, uh, the, the tool of the, of the bacteria. The, the, the bacteria are really the, the important part of what our body is. Mm. Um, I don't believe that, but anyway, they, th there's a reason they look at it that way. So fiber, fiber is what feeds your bacteria. Fiber prevents you from getting irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, and inflammation of your colon. Fiber prevents you from getting diverticulosis, diverticulitis, and, and hemorrhoids. Um, fiber is so important for the function of from everything from your brain to your colon, to your digestion of your proteins, to vitamins. Um, so fiber is really, really important. So look at your food as fiber. Well, that's amazing. Thank you, Dr. Saunders. Um, uh, Fiber Greens, our supplement now, sales are plummeting. <laughs> Nobody's buying it anymore. Just get it from your food. No, that's good. Um, like, hey, that's that's really what we're all about, sharing the, sharing the truth, sharing the best things that work uh, for people. And so one question I have, I have some friends that like, they can't eat broccoli or vegetables. Like they don't tolerate it. Their stomach gets upset and they get inflamed. So they're like, full on carnivores. You know, it's one of our friends in, in Utah, um, Mike, whose last name shall rena remain anonymous, but like, so let's say somebody is eating mostly carnivore for whatever reason, how are they getting the fiber? Is there fiber in red meat or chicken or whatever else? Oh, okay. So remember there's some fiber, there's protein fibers, uh, in meat as well. So uh, uh, tendons and ligaments, all the collagen that's in there, that's all uh, fiber. Keratin is part of it too. That's, that's all fiber. So yeah, there are, there are protein <clears throat> fibers, but um, so there is some fiber um, in, in a carnivore diet. Uh, but if you're not eating any um, fiber, uh, vegetable fibers at all, um, then you're not getting the sugar, uh, the carbohydrates, and you're going to have an entirely different uh, uh, bacteria in your colon if you're yeah. eating a carnivore diet as opposed to if you're eating a, like a vegan diet would be completely different. Sure. So somebody close to me was just diagnosed with a H. pylori infection in their gut, and they've been having some autoimmune issues. You might know who I'm talking about, but uh, to keep their identity anonymous. So H. pylori infection in the gut, um, affects immune system. Can you talk a little about that? Cause it's kind of connected to what you've been talking about. Yeah. Okay. So, um, H. pylori is a, a type of bacteria that can grow in an acid environment. So it can grow in the stomach. Um, and, uh, a lot of people have it as just it's a, a, a normal bacteria kind of thing. Uh, and, and some people it's an invasive infection that actually gets into the lining of the, of the stomach and creates ulcers. Uh, and, uh, and then having H. pylori uh, also is an indicator of immune dysfunction. So it's not so much that the H. pylori causes the immune dysfunction, it's an indicator that 
your immune system is not functioning well if you have this kind of infection. Uh, and that can be true with uh, other things like um, parasites and yeasts. You know, nobody gets a yeast infection unless they have an, an immune dysfunction. There's no way to get a yeast infection unless your immune system is, is uh, specifically your T cells are dysfunctional. Hmm. So, so that's, it's more of an indicator, like you get the infection because the immune immunity is, is off, not the other way around. And how do you typically fix that? Um, well, one important thing is fiber in the diet. Fiber is actually something that helps grow the bacteria that provides the nutrients and the anti-inflammatory um, chemicals uh, and <coughs> um, like butyrate um, and, and provides mechanisms for the, uh, for the immune system to function well. So that's part of it. But there are other things that are really important, like even your emotional state, if you're, uh, if you're stressed, like really stressed, you produce the stress hormones that suppress your immune system and allow like, like I, we, I had somebody who had thrush yeast on the tongue just because uh, she produced a lot of adrenal hormones that suppressed her immune system. And people who are getting um, like taking prednisone pills or cortisone pills, uh, they get the same thing. They can get thrush from the suppressed immune system. Um, the other thing like with H. pylori specifically is, is eating um, periodically. So you, eat, you uh, eat a meal and then you get an empty stomach. Uh, so you have five hours between meals. So if you eat at seven o'clock in the morning, then you eat at noon, um, then you eat at five o'clock in the afternoon. That's kind of an ideal separation that allows you to reset this, the, the stomach acid uh, so that you don't grow the H. pylori. Okay, good stuff. How many grams of fiber should someone eat in a day? Okay, so a, a, a sort of a, a, a marker, ideal marker is around 40 grams or more. So uh, the average American eats about nine grams of fiber a day. And uh, 40 grams is, is kind of a, I, I, I almost want to say minimum, uh, but at least 40 grams would be great. And that's, that's not easy to get from food. Like you, like no. even a big salad can maybe be 10 to 15 grams. Max. No, 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 no. A, a, a whole dinner plate of salad is like four to five grams of fiber. Wow. Uh, an orange wow. is like four grams of fiber. A, um, a an avocado is like uh, eight grams of fiber or six, six or eight depends on the size. Uh, an apple is like three grams of fiber. You know, there's not a lot of fiber in food. And so to get 40 grams, you've got to eat a lot of food. Well, and that's, that's even harder to do when you're trying to keep your carbs down to, you know, 20 net grams because apples and oranges have a lot of fructose that can, you know, uh, affect your blood sugar. And so yeah. that's where the avocados probably are a much better choice. Uh, well, because avocados and then broccoli and celery and spinach and lettuce and salads and yeah, yeah. so they add up but you know you gotta it's it, it does amount to a lot of food yeah and in fiber itself really you can't really get that in a liquid form like to drink fiber really right other than like you mix it with water but like, like right the stuff we have gets kind of gel gelled or whatever after if it sits too long which yeah, is the point of it helps, but yeah. So that's really why we created the fiber greens was because it is so hard to get that much fiber in your diet just from food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So okay. some people eat; they take like um, chia seeds and they 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 mix them in water and they drink that down. And the 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 gel around the outside is uh, fiber. Uh, their uh, seeds, nuts, uh, they generally have a lot of fiber. Uh, and yeah. on, the, on the ketogenic diet, you can do like walnuts and almonds and that, uh, and coconut. Uh, those, are, those are okay. And they have a lot of fiber. So Joby asks, uh, the vegetables you mentioned, like broccoli, spinach, celery, should, be, should they be eaten raw? Um, yeah, either way. Um, if, if you look at it, though, if, if you take like a dinner plate of salad like let, let's just take a uh, baby spinach right you got all this uh, this baby spinach salad and it's a whole mm -hmm. you know 10 inch dinner plate uh 
and then you cook it down. Um, it cooks down to nothing, and you you got this little little teeny bit of uh, of of uh, spinach after it's cooked. So um, w- one of the things that you can do is cook it because you can you can you can eat a whole lot more of the cooked stuff than you do of the raw stuff. So um, so yeah so yeah both raw yeah. and cooked. Rianne says uh, when they take fiber supplements, they feel bloated, gassy, and constipated seems to create problems for me. Is that because the supplement has other stuff in it or why might that be happening? Um, Most of that has to do with the bacteria growing in your intestines. So uh, when you're starting on on a high fiber diet, sometimes you just have to start slow because the bacteria are going to take the whatever you're not uh, digesting and, and make gas out of it, for example. Um, some people have something called SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth, and the bacteria in the small intestine are not supposed to be there. But if you have them there, then, uh, then the food that you're eating can allow them to produce gas, and that makes you gassy. Um, so looking to see if you have uh, SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth, um, and then um, starting slow on small amounts of fiber to allow the, the good bacteria that you want to grow uh, to, uh, to increase and take over uh, for those bacteria that are producing all the gas. Hmm. How about lower carb multigrain bread? Is that a good source of fiber? Um, as a rule, yes, because when they have lower carb in those bread, uh, they use fillers like uh, cellulose and uh, pectin uh, and fructooligosaccharides, uh, inulin. Uh, they, they actually put fiber in the bread uh, to take up space, <laughs> so to speak, uh, mm-hmm. or to take the place of the carbohydrates that they're taking out. So the low carb breads often are very high in fiber and uh, they could be okay. Yeah, and there's some really good low carb tortillas that somebody mentioned too. I've had those before, and they have they add that um, it's like one or two net grams of carbs, and like all right, because all the rest of like a taco or fajita is is good low carb stuff, like the meat and well, veggies. Well, it's funny because the rest of it it are is really if you if you knew what it was, it's food that you wouldn't normally eat. So like it's cardboard, literally, they use cellulose fiber in there, uh, to, uh, which is just cardboard, wow. <laughs> uh, to fill in the space for the, the carbs that they're not putting in there. Yeah, wow. Okay, I'm going to turn our attention to some diabetes-related questions. Uh, we've got one about our berberine supplement. Um, somebody has taken it for two days. They're getting tummy aches and watering stool. Just wondering if that will stop. I think we had asked this at the end of last time as well. Yeah. Yeah. So berberine, um, because of the way it affects the, the production of, of glucose or the utilization of glucose, um, it often affects the intestines. And when people have a problem, it's usually an intestinal thing. So what you do is you just take a lower dose, take it once a day, take it with food. Um, and, uh, and then after a while that will stop, that will go away. All right. Uh, bum, 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 bum. So Debbie says I've done the five day fast and now intermittent 24 hour fasting and drinking only coffee in the morning, drinking herbal tea with two drops of stevia. I've lost 20 pounds, but my blood sugar numbers stay around 180 and might go down to 120. Is insulin resistance in my way of going down further with my sugars, or do I have to wait a few more weeks? It's almost been three weeks. Wow, three weeks, that's a long time because usually uh, you use up the sugar um, in the, 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 um, the liver makes sugar out of what's called glycogen. It's the stored sugar. You use that up usually in a few days. It's not, it's not something that lasts weeks. So, uh, so the blood sugar being 180, uh, there has to be another source of sugar. So it could be protein, uh, for example. Um, and so something to be really careful of with insulin resistance 
is this taste of sweet. So if you're just drinking coffee and you put stevia in it or something, then you may be causing more insulin resistance because of the taste of sweet causes the release of insulin, which blocks you from using fat for energy and forces you to use um, protein that's made into glucose. So your glucose actually goes up. It's called gluconeogenesis. The liver could do that if, if you, you can't use fat. So um, maybe you're not in ketosis and that's the problem. Uh, and uh, consider maybe there's something in your diet that has uh, to a sweet that is producing insulin. And for some people, um, I actually had a case of this where somebody was, uh, his blood sugar was not coming down. He wasn't losing weight. Uh, he was on a total keto diet, um, but he was eating a lot of protein. And uh, protein causes a release of insulin in some people more than others. And so an excessive amount of protein can sometimes do that. So there may be an issue there with having too much protein. Uh, so the only thing you have to avoid is uh, sugar and fat and protein, carbohydrates, fat and protein, everything else is okay. So, <laughs> so eat a lot of fiber <laughs> um, and, and actually probably fat's okay if you add like coconut oil or something like that um, in your coffee. What about, what about dirt? Just like eat dirt? Like what is that? Carbs, fats, protein, like that's just minerals, isn't it? That's just mineral dust. Yeah, that's like, yeah. Yeah, well, the, the eat dirt, dirt diet. Uh, I don't know if that's going <laughs> to be real exciting for too many people. Uh, all right, here's a good question we get every once in a while. When I wake up in the morning, my blood sugar is about 89. And before I get out of bed about 20 minutes later, it goes up to 140 to 160 in a few minutes. Why does this happen? And what can I wow, do? Wow, that's a great question. Okay, we, we <laughs> answer this question almost every week. And that is... Um, that's great that you measured it first and then, and then waiting a little while because then you can see that in the morning it's actually okay. Um, what happens is, is when, you, um, uh, when you wake up, your cortisol levels go up and cortisol makes you resistant to insulin and you already have some insulin resistance. Uh, and, and so your sugar starts dropping down and your um, glucagon, so the insulin gets low, and glucagon tells your liver, make more sugar. So the liver starts making sugar, but you're insulin resistant, so you can't use that sugar. So the sugar starts going way up. Um, and that is produced by your liver. That's, that's where that sugar comes from. You didn't eat it. Uh, you didn't have to eat it. But the, this process of, of everything that's going on in the morning uh, to, to release cortisol and get you going in the morning. And you need that. That's what everybody does. There's nothing wrong with that. So all that means is one thing that you still have insulin resistance. So working on the insulin resistance is still a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. That's good. I wanted to mention or address something Rayanne said after, after your previous answer, she said, just stop eating. It's no fun anymore. And so uh, like, yeah, so uh, I get it. Like it's hard. I think you're I'm kind sorry. of joking when you when you say just don't eat anything, right? So well, uh, how about how about looking at it this way? Um, you, you go through a a period of time where you pretty much have to uh, avoid everything you like. Um, Jack Lalane said, um, "If it tastes good, spit it out," um, and, and that was in the 1950s. So. Um, you go through a period of time where, where you go, okay, I'm going to make a sacrifice. I'm going to sacrifice the things that I like um, so that I can have a healthy body. And then after, after you normalize your metabolism again, then you can periodically eat things you like. You know, once you have a normal metabolism and you go to a birthday party and they're having ice cream and it's your favorite flavor and you're going, oh, I'd really like some of that ice cream. And then you have some of it and it's okay. And it's perfectly fine because you don't have insulin resistance anymore. Um, so going through the period of time, making the sacrifice so that you can normalize your metabolism so that you can eat the things you like periodically. Um, but it's not like, you know, uh, my father-in-law drinks, I think he said two six packs. So that would be uh, 12 cans of uh, Diet Dr. Pepper every day. Uh, and he has diabetes. And I'm like, 
dad, you can't do that. <laughs> uh, that's, that's not healthy at all. Uh, and he says, but I like Dr. Pepper. Um, and so, um, so we're talking to him about like sacrificing for a period of time to get the diabetes normalized. And then, uh, and then if he had an occasional one, that's not going to be an issue. I don't know. Yeah. So I'm going to go, I had a little thought here. I'm going to, I'm going to run with it and see where it goes. This might be a little weird, but earlier. Oh, no. <laughs> Joe's got a thought. Uh, you had, you had the, uh, you talked about how our bacteria are basically like just along for the ride and we're the vessels for that. Right. And I think in, in a similar way, like human beings are somewhat along for the ride in various systems that we're a part of. And like, I want to talk about like, just like the fact that we are in systems that are not necessarily healthy, big food, big pharma, big medical, big education, big media, big entertainment, like all these things are kind of set up to transport us through their things in a, in a way that kind of makes enslaves us in a way. And like, how many years have we been a part of this? And like, and so I honestly think diabetes is a, a product of that like all of the food you look at when you go to a grocery store unless you're eating like organic vegetables and fruits and maybe some meats like almost everything else in there has added sugar added chemicals toxins everywhere um like we are bombarded all the time you know what we're what we hear in the media what we're taught in schools what like everywhere you go like we're being taught misinformation so like this whole program is almost a, a way to like say, I've had enough. This isn't working for me. I need something different that's going to work. And so like, yeah, this is hard. You got to stop eating carbs. You got to like do other things that are in this book. But like, this is like the answer to all of that stuff. And it's going to take some work because your body's been going through a lot of bad stuff for a long time. And so, but just think about like, you got to think about like how much better you're going to feel. You're going to be able to see more clearly. Your gut is going to change, like all the bacteria, like all these different things that have been fighting against you and causing you pain and suffering. Um, it's like, it's all part of the process. And so just think about like, and I, even before Dr. Saunders was, <laughs> I was joking about going through pain and suffering, like, yeah, that kind of can suck but like that is the way like going through hard things is the way to grow and to get free of all these things and so that's my little soapbox a little thought i had but it kind of seems I think, to that's, I think that's a great thought i think that's a, a really good idea to to consider that um that that all around us is um uh, things that are not necessarily healthy for us. And, and so we have to, uh, at some point say no. Yeah. yeah. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. Here we go. <laughs> um, I answered that one. Okay. Valerie, this is a great one. So she's got a small body build. She's lost 46 pounds with breast cancer five years ago. That's dear to my heart. Cause I lost my mom to breast cancer eight years ago. So she was 116 pounds. She went back up to 122. Now through phase one, she's lost five pounds and is down to 117. Can't lose any more weight. How do I keep the weight on while the blood sugar is dropping? Okay. Gosh, it'd be really interesting to know what your blood sugar is. So you need an insulin test and a C peptide test. Um, uh, you need to know uh, what your insulin uh, is doing, because if you if you don't have enough insulin, that it's very hard to get uh, carbs and protein and fat into your your um, cells to to make uh, to put on weight or to keep the weight on. Um, otherwise, you're going to lose weight, and so uh, and insulin is the only hormone that does that. So it's really important to know what your insulin is. Um, a, a lot of you are going to need that. You're going to need to know what the insulin is, but especially people who don't want to lose weight because the ketogenic diet is not really a, a great weight loss program. It kind of normalizes your weight, um, ideally. But if people are losing weight, then that indicates that 
there, there may be a problem with not enough insulin. And, uh, and we think of insulin just in terms of getting sugar into the cells, but I don't think that uh, we, we emphasize enough uh, the fact that insulin is required to get amino acids, most of our amino acids into the cells. So, uh, so it's important for building muscle and, uh, and protein and everything else in your body. So it's, uh, it's not just one thing, I think. So your next step is to test your insulin levels and see peptide levels. And, uh, and depending on what those show, a, a good test to do would be uh, an insulin sensitivity test. And that is, uh, it's like a glucose tolerance <laughs> test with insulin. So you, you, you drink 100 grams of, of it's a syrup of, of glucose. Uh, and then they measure your every hour, they measure your insulin and sugar level and then insulin, sugar, insulin, sugar for three hours. Uh, and that gives you uh, an idea of what's your insulin doing, what's your sugar doing. And that, that's going to be really helpful. Awesome. All right. All right. Another question about the rum soaked peanuts, which is one of our uh, advertisements we have. And I'll, I can probably address this one, Dr. Scott. So good. Uh, <laughs> So we have some marketing out there that talks about rum soaked peanuts and like there is research out there that like a small amount of alcohol and a small amount of peanuts can actually lower your blood sugar. Now, of course, you would want to test this. Now, one thing we need to make more clear that we tried to make clear is you don't drink the rum. Like when you soak peanuts in rum, like they barely absorb hardly any of it. Any of it. So the point of that marketing was to tell, tell you, you know, share like there are remedies out there like that, but even better ones that can help with blood sugar and insulin resistance and things like that. So we then go on to teach about like cinnamon and chromium and vanadium, vitamin D, vitamin K. Those are the things that are even way better, more healthy than peanuts. Um, so Dr. Saunders, anything to add on that? Yeah, um, that's just something that gets somebody's attention. Yeah, for sure. So that is it. Okay. I answered the berberine. Um, you had, you'd mentioned uh, continuous glucose meters, monitors. Kathy asked, what's your take on the 14 day Libre? Um, I, I think it's good. Um, gosh, uh, I've had several people who, who get it. And I think it's like $80 for a 14 day uh, button to, to put on and they're okay. You have to take in uh, take into account that they're not like accurate. Like it's not the same as a blood draw going to the lab. It's to give you an idea of what's happening, and so it's really good for for its use for its purpose, and not as a oh my blood sugar was 150 and it went it went up to 153. Um, you know what? That's the same number. That's not even a difference at all. Um, <clears throat> The, the, the benefit of them is when you say, um, gosh, um, it stays down around 100 most of the time. But when I ate that spaghetti, oh, my gosh, it just shot up. Uh, or, or I've had people tell me that they didn't realize that eating fat when they had um, butter uh, or something that their blood sugar shot up because fat can produce insulin resistance. And they didn't realize that that would happen, that they thought, yo, I can eat all the fat I want and it's not gonna affect me. Um, so uh, <clears throat> yes, I think they work fine. Don't look at them as the number being absolute. The number is like within 20%, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. I did a test, like I tested my blood sugar while we were on a webinar a couple of weeks ago and um, one minute it's 105, tested a, a minute later out of my other hand is 83. Like. Uh, okay, well, it's probably somewhere in there. So um, somebody asked, so their doctor is having them take 5,000 units of vitamin D3, which is great. And we also have 5,000 in Cinechroma. So is taking them both too much for one day? Oh, no, actually 10,000 units is a standard dose. That is, that's a physiologic dose. So if you don't get any sunshine, or if it's winter time and you're above the 43rd parallel, you're, you're not going to get any, even if you are out in the sun, you know, laying out naked, uh, you're still not going to get any vitamin D um, uh, because the, the angle of the sun is too much at that point. The, the sun needs to be overhead. 
So in those cases, um, uh, the 10,000 units a day is a physiologic dose. That's, that's what you would make if you got sunshine. So that's perfect. Yeah, awesome. All right, Richard, he's 82. He wants to know what is what should his blood pressure be? Ah, okay. Yeah, we did talk about this on the on the um, cardiovascular webinar um, a couple of weeks ago. We talked about what should what should your blood pressure be? Uh, it, you know, um, and when they look at people over 60, uh, they find the optimum level is about 150 over 80 ish, 150 over 85. Um, 150 over 90 is still in the good range if you look at the um, uh, the death rate versus the blood pressure. There's a, a U curve. If your blood pressure drops low, your death rate goes up. If your blood pressure is high, your death rate goes up. And there's this lowest point down there, which is uh, somewhere around 150, uh, 160 in other studies, 145 in other studies, but somewhere around 150. Systolic. All right. Okay. Um, William said he's seen warnings about vitamin E that can cause cancer. Is this a certain version or type of E sp full spectrum? Okay. That's a very good question. Okay. So vitamin E, if you take the chemical vitamin E, it's DL alpha tocopherol. Um, and <clears throat> if that's all you get, then there is, um, there, it's working against itself. So D is the form that's good and L is the form that's not good. And the L form binds, but doesn't work. So you're actually, it's counterproductive. And so when they did studies on vitamin E and heart disease and cancer, and they found, oh my gosh, people taking vitamin E pills, they're worse off than the people <laughs> not taking the vitamin E. Um, the studies were not good, by the way, but besides that, there, it, it wasn't a clear benefit, right? So, uh, so vitamin E, the best way to get it is from food. Almonds have vitamin E. Most nuts have vitamin E. Everything green has vitamin E. Um, uh, and uh, let's see, what's avocados, I think. Um, and anyway, because the plant forms are only going to have the D form and they're going to have mixed tocopherols and tocotrienols. And that is, there's like eight different forms of vitamin E. And when you take the chemical, you only get one. And what you need is all of them. And so that's why it's important to get a natural source of vitamin E. All right. Hey, if you're still with us, thank you for joining us. Um, would love to have you in the chat. If you could just share a little bit, if you have... Um, receive some helpful information today or in the past from watching our webinars, put a little something in the note there, share it with everyone, share some um, progress reports, things like that. We love to kind of share that uh, good news, the testimonials, the momentum. And it looks like Leslie made it. All right, oh welcome. Nice. Unbelievable. All the things yeah. I had to do to get here today, but- I believe it. I have done well, so. <laughs> good to have you well we've barely survived without you leslie i'm gonna um i just ask people if they can share some of their things in the chat any progress uh we've been going through some great questions we started talking about about uh fiber and got into gut health and bacteria and all sorts of good things here so um yeah i don't know what do you want how can you start you know keep us rolling here leslie <laughs> Well, I'm excited to re-listen to this, so that's exciting. Um, I don't, I, I don't know. I'm just jumping in here, guys, but I have gotten a lot of emails from many of you, um, and lots of really good questions. I know that you, we can't do all of them today, and uh, yeah, we have like ten minutes left. So, but what I would encourage you to do is, if you have heart questions, because I'm getting a lot of questions specifically about the heart, pop on our webinar tomorrow. Uh, we have two webinars each week, which is so exciting. Um, so many of you, you just can't get enough of us, right? You need us to come back twice a week. I get it. I mean, Dr. Saunders is pretty cool. So um, we're going to be here tomorrow, 12 central time. And that is that webinar is focused on the heart. This one, uh, type two. Guys, they're different. They're different webinars. There is some overlap that we do talk about. Uh, so 
hop on. Just make sure you come to that too, if you can. And if you can't, be sure to listen to the web or the um, replays. Lots of questions about that. Also, uh, we have an entire YouTube channel, which these guys have probably told you about. Um, no, actually, I haven't. I haven't mentioned anything like that. I have okay. not. Okay, great good. Job. So BartonWebinar.com, all that yeah. would be good. Yeah. All right. So um, this is what I'd recommend. Go to BartonWebinar.com. If you're new, if you're old, if you're <laughs> whatever, that's the hub. That's the place where you'll find the most up-to-date information about us and all that's going on. Uh, that'll give you a link to our YouTube channel where you will find the uh, Healthy Heart webinars and the Type 2 webinars. So, um, for example, I get a lot of questions from people who want to know about fasting or, or they'll say, hey, I was on a webinar one time. Dr. Saunders mentioned that there may be some benefits to fasting when I have Type 2. The best thing you can do is to go to our channel, type in fasting. You will find a lot of webinars where we talk about this. Um, or morning blood sugar, for example, we, I couldn't tell you how many times we get asked about that, right? We answered it today. We did. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. See? yeah. So if you go the, to the dawn webinar, effect, yes. Mm -hmm. Or the, yes, the phenomenon, I think is what I hear it called. The dawn over. phenomenon. So, yeah. um, that we answer that question right at that bartonwebinar.com. We have our top, I, I, I don't even, I don't know if it's 10, it might be eight top questions right there uh, that we get asked very often. And here's another fun, if you're new, this is what I would recommend for you. There is a webinar called our top 25 most asked questions. Go there right after this, or the next time you want to learn, hop over to that webinar. It'll blow your mind. It'll answer a lot of your questions and you'll feel so much more confident doing uh, the diabetes solution kit. Hopefully you've been talking about that. Hopefully that's what you guys have been um, in discussion about as well, but that is kind of, that's the bread and butter of all that we do is the diabetes solution kit. All of the extra stuff is, um, you know, helpers is what I would call it, but the diabetes solution kit is where you want to start. And then if you want to continue your education, you go to the YouTube channel. That's what I would say. So, um, I think that's pretty much it for what I would add right now. That's great. Uh, Okay. So somebody said, we never answer the questions. Why? So we're going to do it right now. I think this is her question. Uh, is taking a probiotic pill helpful to increase good bacteria in the gut? Um, maybe. <laughs> That's not an easy question to answer because some people need that probiotic and other people don't. Uh, so it's, it's not a simple question. In fact, um, I'll tell you about one case that I had a specific one where somebody had irritable bowel syndrome and I recommended a probiotic. So uh, he and his wife were in the room and he went down to the health food store and went into the refrigerator and bought the most expensive, highest dose probiotic in the, in the refrigerator. Go, this has to be better because it's like really expensive and it's super high dose, billions and billions, hundreds of billions uh, of bacteria. And so uh, in each dose, uh, it didn't work at all. Meanwhile, his wife uh, goes to the store, she's shopping at the grocery store, and she looks up, she goes, oh, um, yeah, the doctor said my husband needs a probiotic. She goes, mm. picks the cheapest one off the shelf and uh, brings it home, and that one worked for him. So, uh, you know, there's just, it's not the, 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 there is a good probiotic or a bad probiotic. It's what does your body need? What does your colon need? Uh, and that's why there's one book we talked about fiber. And one book you could read is called Fiber Fueled. Um, Dr. Will Bolsheviks is the author. And uh, he talks extensively about how to get enough fiber and how to get the fiber working and how to get the right kinds of fiber and the right kinds of probiotics and which kinds of bacteria, uh, all of that. It's, it's a really good discussion on fiber and bacteria in the colon. All right, awesome. Well, I picked the wrong question apparently, but now I've got the right question for this person that I missed. So my apologies. Okay, this is a good one. Other than iron and protein drinks, what can my friend do to get her blood platelets up? She has ITP is an amputee, has diabetes, and she's currently at platelets of under 40. Ooh, ah. So uh, platelets are um, what causes coagulation of the blood. 
So if you cut yourself, um, the first thing that comes along to stop the bleeding is platelets. Uh, and so platelets come in and when they encounter inflammation, they start getting sticky and they stick together until they form a clot uh, around there that blocks off the, the, uh, bl the blood flow. So um, if you don't have enough platelets, you bleed internally. And so, uh, and we break blood vessels all the time internally. It's not something that only happens when you get cut. You bump into a door, you break a blood vessel, but you won't even notice it because your platelets are gonna clog that up really quickly. If you don't have platelets, what happens? They don't clog up very quickly. And then you have uh, bruises happen all over your body. It's called ITP. Um, and so, you, uh, so having those platelets is really important. So how do you get your platelets up? Okay, getting the platelets up means getting rid of the um, autoimmune disease that's causing the problem in the first place. So you have to work on the immunity um, to, to find out why that's happening. And it's, that's not an easy process. You have to do a lot of testing to find out if there's any nutrient deficiencies, for example, something as simple as vitamin D. Um, uh, the Cinechroma has 5,000 units of vitamin D. You might even take two a day of vitamin D to get your vitamin D levels up because that's the macrophage activating factor that allows the cellular immunity to work and stops the autoimmune diseases from happening. So there's a lot of evidence to show that low vitamin D leads to autoimmune disease. But that's not the only one. Zinc is also really important. And, and, so, and not only lack of nutrients, but uh, having uh, uh, high cortisol levels, high stress levels uh, increases the risk of autoimmune disease. Allergies, food allergies and sensitivities, uh, celiac disease, um, so there's a lot of testing that would need to be done to, to say, why is the autoimmune disease there in the first place? And then deal with that so that the, um, so that the, the autoimmune disease go down so the platelets can go back up because what, what, what's happening right now is the, the antibodies are eating up the, the platelets. And so she may be making enough platelets, but antibodies are eating it up. So find out why first, get rid of the inflammation um, to fix that problem. All right. Uh, Brian shared the link to the Amazon, to the book Fiber Fueled by Will Bullswoos. Bolsheviks. Uh, Bolsheviks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you can find that in the chat or just yeah search fiber fueled in Amazon. So that's good stuff. All right, Leslie, I'm going to let you take this over. Okay. I don't know for sure if all, I don't know for sure if all of these are unanswered, yes. but um, oh, we have like one minute. So, yeah. okay. Um, this is a really good question though. Uh, <laughs> this has come up before too. What about homemade sauerkraut for probiotics? How do you feel about that? That's great. Homemade sauerkraut is excellent for probiotics. In fact, if you, if you do your own uh, fermenting of anything, that's uh, actually a good way to get probiotics. The problem is, uh, comes when people who uh, are trying to get probiotics from bottled sauerkraut. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you realize that when you bottle the sauerkraut, you kill all the bacteria? It's gone. And, and also yogurt is another one. People make their own yogurt. They get really good probiotics. But um, yogurt is pasteurized. And when it's pasteurized, they, uh, they kill all the bacteria in it. And then they can put a drop of, of, of uh, some bacteria in there and say, oh, this has, it's, it's yogurt um, with probiotics. And so they add some in. But it's not as good as making the yogurt yourself. Uh, so fermenting your own foods uh, uh, is actually a good way to get probiotics. Hey, Leslie, maybe we could, uh, there's a couple of platelet questions here, the bleeder question. While we're on that, like that might be a good way to finish if you've got two minutes, Dr. Saunders. Okay. okay. So Bruce says, what about platelets? Two numbers under normal. Does that mean I need more platelets? Well, two numbers under normal. Uh, don't take normal as an absolute. Someone who has 110 Playlists, that's fine. If you're over 100, you're probably okay. You're probably not in uh, an ITP. You're not probably 
uh, autoimmune uh, disease breaking down your platelets. But when you're 40, that's pretty low. You're probably going to get a lot of bruising. So the way to tell about low platelets is if you're getting bruising and you bleed like crazy when you get cut or get bloody noses or something like that, um, then that could be a platelet issue. That's not, that's one of the possibilities. If your platelets are low and you're bleeding a lot, bruising and all that, um, then it, it probably from platelets. But if you don't have any bleeding issues at all and your platelets are on the low side of normal or, or you, you've got, you know, 120 or something like that, um, then uh, that, that's probably, that's not an issue. It's not likely to be an issue. And then Judy had a related question. Uh, what you were talking about earlier, would that help a person who's got what they call is a free bleeder? Well, no, the uh, free bleeder is mostly a problem with the clotting factors. So there's uh, 12 clotting factors that are involved. There's a whole cascade of clotting. It's not just like, like uh, for a clot to form, a whole bunch of things have to happen. And you could have a problem with... Uh, with factor 10, for example, is a uh, common <clears throat> um, hemophilia is uh, the free bleeders and uh, they don't stop bleeding very easily at all because, uh, because their clotting factors are off and that's not a platelet problem, that's a clotting factor problem. Round of applause for Dr. Saunders, we're gonna let you go, you're amazing. Thank we you. Love you. All right, okay, bye. 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 <laughs> Hey, Leslie, awesome. somebody had asked what episode number we're on, and I just said 180, her, her. I didn't know. Like 180 something. <laughs> okay, let me look. I'm on my laptop, so I feel like I am all over the place here. I'm not usually on my laptop, but my, my computer is doing something crazy. So let me double check that right now. I'm going to guess 189, but I could be wrong. All right. 189, guys. Hey, all right. Are we getting caught up on posting these to YouTube? Like, what was the last one? Yeah, I just got two of them today that'll go up. So we'll be Wait. 188 will go up today, probably. So. All right. Good, yes. good. Any other questions on here that I can help to answer? Um, what was the age? Oh, I don't know that. Okay. Um, that's a couple of questions about fish oils, it looks like. Yeah, my chiropractor just yesterday or two days ago told me she's not a big fan of krill oil and prefers a little more, more like fish oils and some other things so um something about the krill oil she didn't like so i don't know if that's helpful or not but we're actually working on our own formula she was looking at some different options for us and we'll be sharing more on that soon so look at this i learn new things when i'm on the webinar guys so i didn't know that that's exciting yeah. see all the yeah. stuff that I take, we just make it and then I can have our own products. This is great. <laughs> That's right. Good to know. Okay. Sorry about my lighting and everything today, guys. I'm so bummed that I missed most of the webinar. This is where I come to learn too. So now I got to go watch the replay. So um, I don't know if there's anything else, guys, but again, bartonwebinar.com. Again, that's the hub and use code webinar25 to save 25% on anything that you want, including the diabetes solution kit, which is uh, that's a big discount on something that's already not very expensive. So it's a mm -hmm. good deal. And then yeah. come back tomorrow, uh, for the healthy heart webinar. I think we're going to be talking, uh, about cholesterol. So it'll be another really good webinar. Some of you've been around for a while know that, uh, there are some myths out there about cholesterol and Dr. Saunders is going to tell us the truth. So be sure to hop on. Yeah, there's a few questions that we didn't get to. My apologies. Um, someone had asked about their doctor, I think didn't like getting, didn't want to necessarily take them off metformin. We've covered that topic quite a bit. So go back, like Leslie said, in our YouTube channel and, um, you know, get on there and search for metformin and you'll probably learn a lot more about that or search, you know, doctor or whatever, a keyword like that. So um, but yeah, if you didn't get your question answered, just come back next week for the next fixed blood sugar webinar, or go find the answer that we've probably already covered in one through 188. <laughs> we've talked about a few things. Yes, that's for sure. All right. Awesome. Well, this is good. Thanks, Joe, for taking over all my duties too. So I appreciate no it. No problem. It's good for me. <laughs> well, this okay. was fun. Thank you guys. Come back next week and 
have a great rest of your week. Hopefully see you tomorrow. Yeah. See ya. Bye-bye.